What's better than listening to the Radiology Review? Nothing. Well, true. But you could buy our book, The Board Exam Study Guide, Episodes 1 through 101, available for purchase as a book on Amazon or in Kindle version. Welcome to the Radiology Review Podcast, your on-the-go source for radiology education with your host, Dr. Matt Covington, a board-certified radiologist. Please follow the podcast on Twitter at RadRevPodcast. Send emails to theradiologyreview at gmail.com or visit the website theradiologyreview.com. Welcome back to the Radiology Review Podcast. On this episode, I will provide an overview of tuberous sclerosis for radiology board exams. This is a topic I have touched on on a few of the prior episodes, but there is so much here that I believe a standalone episode is in order because this involves so many different organ systems and is one entity that is certainly high yield for the ABR core exam. And I hope this episode will be helpful for many of you. A free downloadable study guide on this topic is available on my website, theradiologyreview.com. I also want to remind listeners that discount codes for various board review and radiology educational products are frequently available at theradiologyreview.com. So for those of you preparing for radiology board exams, you may want to check out what current discount codes may be available for board preparation resources. That could save you a few dollars. Finally, remember that you can follow at RadRev Podcast on Twitter or Instagram, where on most days I am posting some sort of educational fact that can be helpful for radiology board review. Without further ado, let's get into the questions and answers for this episode. First question, what is the classic triad of clinical symptoms for tuberous sclerosis? The classic clinical triad for tuberous sclerosis are first, seizures, second, mental impairment, and third, adenoma sebaceum. Note that this triad is not obligatory for tuberous sclerosis diagnosis, and many patients with tuberous sclerosis do not demonstrate all three of these presenting features. It is important to be aware of this triad, however, for board preparation purposes, as these symptoms in a question stem may guide you toward recognition that tuberous sclerosis is being tested. Next, true or false. Identification of a tuberous sclerosis complex 1 or 2 genetic mutation is sufficient to diagnose tuberous sclerosis. The answer here is true. Tuberous sclerosis complex 1 encodes Hamerton and tuberous sclerosis complex 2 encodes tuberin and the TSC2 mutation is more common. Both of these are part of the mTOR pathway, M-T-O-R, mTOR, and both impair tumor suppression genes. Next and related question, true or false? Genetic testing that reveals no TSC1 or 2 genetic mutation excludes the possibility of tuberous sclerosis. The answer here is false. Although identifying one of these genes, TSC1 or 2, does confirm tuberous sclerosis, lack of testing positive for one of these genes does not exclude the possibility that someone still has tuberous sclerosis. In fact, up to something like 25% of tuberous sclerosis complex patients will not show a TSC1 or 2 mutation upon testing. Therefore, lack of a TSC1 or 2 gene does not rule out or exclude tuberous sclerosis. Next, if the classic clinical triad of tuberous sclerosis or genetic testing of TSC1 or TSC2 genetic mutations do not identify all tuberous sclerosis patients, how is the diagnosis of tuberous sclerosis confirmed in all cases? This is a complicated answer, but to simplify for radiology board exam purposes, there are major and minor criteria that have been developed for tuberous sclerosis diagnosis. A diagnosis of definite tuberous sclerosis complex is made if one has two major or one major and two minor criteria. Possible tuberous sclerosis complex diagnosis is made if there is one major 
or at least two minor criteria present. Next, what are the major criteria for tuberous sclerosis complex? The major criteria for diagnosis of tuberous sclerosis complex are, in no particular order, three or more angiofibromas, two or more angiomyolipomas, two or more ungual or periungual fibromas, lymphangioliomyomatosis, three or more hyperpigmented macules, a cardiac rhabdomyoma, a collagenoma, also termed a shagreen patch, or maybe it's shagreen patch, I'm not sure, that is spelled S-H-A-G-R-E-E-N, and the shagreen patch is a subepidermal collagenous nevus, as well as a subependymal giant cell astrocytoma, a subependymal hamartoma, multiple retinal hamartomas, and finally, cortical tubers and other cortical dysplasias, including the so-called cerebral white matter migration lines. And that is a lot of information coming at you. If helpful, download the free study guide at theradiologyreview.com and review that in writing. Next, what are the minor criteria for diagnosis of tuberous sclerosis complex? Minor criteria for diagnosis of tuberous sclerosis complex include multiple renal cysts, multiple dental enamel pits, multiple intraoral fibromas, extra renal hamartomas, a retinal chromic patch, and so called confetti skin lesions which are small hypopigmented macules, which are often scattered over the arms, legs, and other regions of the body. Next, true or false? Tuberous sclerosis is an autosomal dominant condition. The answer here is true and false. This is a trick question. Most cases of tuberous sclerosis result from spontaneous mutations, but about one-third of cases are inherited in an autosomal dominant manner. So strictly speaking, if you have inherited tuberous sclerosis complex, it was received in an autosomal dominant fashion. However, most cases of tuberous sclerosis result from a spontaneous mutation. Next. What is the hamartomas mnemonic for tuberous sclerosis? A mnemonic to help you remember some key features of tuberous sclerosis is out there, and it is hamartomas, H-A-M-A-R-T-O-M-A-S. Various forms of this, like most mnemonics, exist. I have made a few of my own modifications to this mnemonic to make it more accurate, at least in my opinion, and potentially more helpful. However, I want you to remember that this mnemonic is not an all-inclusive list of pathology that can be seen with tuberous sclerosis. Let's go through each letter of this mnemonic. H is for hamartomas, more specifically of the skin, eyes, and central nervous system. A is for angiofibromas of the face, which is adenoma sebaceum. M for mental impairment. A for angiomyolipoma of the kidney. R for rhabdomyoma of the heart. T for tubers, which are often cortical or subcortical. O for oral fibromas and dental enamel pits. Another M for migration anomalies of white matter or multiple M for multiple tumors of various organs, A for ash leaf spots, which are hypomelanotic macules, and S for either seizures or chagrin patches. Next question, what are the highest yield CNS tumors to remember for tuberous sclerosis for board exams? This is an important question and I'm going to list three of what I consider the highest yield CNS tumors to remember for tuberous sclerosis for board exams. First is a subependymal giant cell astrocytoma. Classic imaging features for a subependymal giant cell astrocytoma are an intensely enhancing intraventricular mass near the foramen of Monroe, 
with frequent calcifications on CT that are somewhat large at presentation, enlarge over time, and present in older children and teenagers most commonly. These are benign tumors and are highly associated with tuberous sclerosis. These can cause obstructive hydrocephalus. Next, I would remember a subependymal hamartoma. Classic imaging features are that of a small calcified irregular interventricular mass or masses. And for reference, a subependymal giant cell astrocytoma is classically over about a centimeter in size and a subependymal hamartoma are classically under one centimeter in size. Subependymal hamartomas can demonstrate variable enhancement, unlike the intense enhancement of a subependymal giant cell astrocytoma, and a subependymal hamartoma classically presents in very young patients, typically within the first six months of life, whereas a subependymal giant cell astrocytoma presents in older children and teenagers most commonly. A subependymal hamartoma can progress in time to become a subependymal giant cell astrocytoma. And finally, I would remember cortical and subcortical tubers. These are often seizure-generating lesions that are present in nearly all tuberous sclerosis patients. Imaging classically shows triangular-shaped lesions in a cortical or juxtacortical distribution, most commonly in the frontal lobes. Most cortical or subcortical tubers do not enhance, but can be detected based on T1 hypointensity and T2 or flare signal hyperintensity when one is outside of the neonatal period. These cortical and subcortical tubers are often somewhat calcified on CT. Next question. What are the highest yield renal tumors to remember for tuberous sclerosis on board exams? First, we need to discuss renal angiomyolipomas. Renal angiomyolipomas are benign and are seen with several phacomatoses including things like neurofibromatosis type 1 and von Hippel-Lindau disease, but a renal angiomyolipoma is especially classically associated with tuberous sclerosis. CT shows macroscopic fat in many but not all cases of renal angiomyolipomas, and these tend not to calcify. MRI also often shows internal fat using things like fat saturation and in and out of phase sequences. Renal angiomyolipomas are hypervascular masses and can show a sunburst appearance on initial or early enhancement sequences and what has been described as an onion peel appearance on more delayed post-contrast imaging. Remember that renal angiomyolipomas have a risk of spontaneous hemorrhage, which can be severe and cause things like retroperitoneal hematomas. If you see a fat-containing renal lesion with calcifications, you should probably think of renal cell carcinoma first rather than a renal angiomyolipoma as renal angiomyolipomas tend not to calcify. And the other renal lesion I would remember for tuberous sclerosis renal cysts, and these are often multiple and bilateral with tuberous sclerosis. Next question. What are some other abdominal lesions associated with tuberous sclerosis? There are several additional abdominal lesions associated with tuberous sclerosis. These include hepatic angiomyolipomas and retroperitoneal lymphangiomyomatosis. With retroperitoneal lymphangiomyomatosis, multiple retroperitoneal cystic lesions can be seen similar to lymphangiomyomatosis of the lungs, and retroperitoneal lymphangiomyomatosis can cause chylus ascites. Go ahead and look up images on those entities if you do not know what those would look like. Next question, true or false? A cardiac rhabdomyoma is the most common cardiac tumor in a fetus. The answer here is true. 
In fact, cardiac rhabdomyomas represent most pediatric cardiac tumors overall, according to what I have read, with most of these diagnosed in the first year of life. These can be either single or multiple. On ultrasound with a cardiac rhabdomyoma, expect a solid hyperechoic mass or masses located within or near the myocardium that on MRI are T1 hypointense and T2 hyperintense. Next question, true or false? Cardiac rhabdomyomas often spontaneously regress. The answer here is true. Cardiac rhabdomyomas often spontaneously regress and often require no treatment unless there is something like ventricular outflow obstruction, valvular impairment, or an uncontrolled arrhythmia. If a cardiac rhabdomyoma is present and is not causing any major symptoms, it can simply be monitored and would be predicted to spontaneously regress in time. Next, what is the prognosis of tuberous sclerosis? Unfortunately, the long-term prognosis of tuberous sclerosis is not great, and in fact, mortality is roughly something like 40% at around age 40. For board exam purposes, I would remember 40% mortality at age 40, and that should steer you in the right direction if they were to ask about this. Next question. What imaging surveillance may be indicated for individuals with tuberous sclerosis? Intensive imaging surveillance has been recommended by certain groups for tuberous sclerosis in attempt to prevent morbidity and mortality. First, brain MRI. For asymptomatic individuals under 25 years of age, brain MRI every one to three years has been suggested. Those with asymptomatic subependymal giant cell astrocytomas may need more frequent brain MRI than this for monitoring. Periodic imaging into adulthood with brain MRI is suggested as clinically directed. Echocardiography has been suggested every one to three years until regression of any cardiac rhabdomyomas is documented. Abdominal MRI has been suggested every one to three years. High-resolution chest CT starting at age 18 in adult females has been suggested to screen for lymph angioliomyomatosis something like every five to seven years until one reaches menopause. Additional non-imaging screening for various complications and associations of tuberous sclerosis has been proposed with things like EKG, renal function monitoring, dental evaluation, eye screening, etc. Last and final question for this episode. True or false? mTOR, M-T-O-R, mTOR inhibitors can be used for treatment of several tuberous sclerosis complications. The answer is true. mTOR inhibitors can be useful for things like enlarging subependymal giant cell astrocytomas and renal angiomyolipomas. That is enough for now. That is a lot of information coming at you. If you would like to review this in writing, download the free study guide at theradiologyreview.com. Thank you for listening to this episode. Keep up the good work and study hard. Remember, you have to study really hard to succeed on radiology board exams. So prepare to succeed. I will catch you on the next episode. Content of this podcast is provided for informal educational purposes only for radiology trainees and radiologists. Medical practitioners, please make your own independent assessment before suggesting a diagnosis or recommending any course of treatment. This podcast should not be used for self-diagnosis or self-treatment and is not a substitute for independent professional medical care. Please consult your own physician regarding any diagnosis, imaging interpretation, or course of treatment. The Radiology Review is pleased to offer the Board Exam Study Guide. Episodes 1 through 101, available for purchase as a book on Amazon or in Kindle version.